There is a land of sailing ships, a land beyond the rivers of Kush which sends its envoys by the Nile, journeying on the waters in vessels of reed. Isaiah 18.1-2, C740 BC, New English Bible. As a matter of fact, trusses of various kinds were used and understood by shipwrights for many centuries before builders and shore-going architects got round to the idea. Most histories of shipbuilding begin with the boats which the ancient Egyptians made for use on the Nile. As the prophet Isaiah seems to have been well aware, these boats were constructed by tying together several parallel bundles of reeds. Actually, these reed boats, which developed from rafts, date back to long before the time of Isaiah, probably to somewhere between 4000 and 3000 BC similar boats are in use today on the White Nile and also on Lake Titicaca in South America. Since the bundles of reeds naturally tapered towards the ends, a roughly boat-shaped form was achieved more or less automatically. Often the long, wispy, ends of the reed bundles were tied in such a way that they turned upwards so as to provide a vertical decoration at the bow and stern. This feature survives today, sometimes not very much changed in shape in the high stem posts of Mediterranean rowing boats especially in the Venetian gondola and the Maltese Geza. Although most of the buoyancy of a ship is provided by the middle part of the hull and comparatively little by the tapering ends, nothing will ever prevent people from putting heavy weights into the ends of a ship. One result of this is that many vessels tend to hog, the two ends tend to droop and the middle of the hull tends to rise. This state of affairs is the opposite of that which exists in roofs and bridges, where the middle of the truss is usually trying to sag below the level of the end supports. This condition is called sagging by engineers. Although in hogging and sagging the forces and deflections are acting in opposite directions, it is clear that in both cases the beam or truss is being bent and that precisely analogous principles and arguments apply. Structurally speaking, a ship's hull is a sort of beam, and the effect of the hogging forces on the flexible reed hulls of the Egyptian boats must have been very obvious. A hot ship is a depressing thing to look at, and this state of affairs needs to be prevented for all sorts of other excellent reasons, so that it was necessary to do something about the situation even in 3000 B. See in fact the Egyptians tackled the problem extremely sensibly. They provided their ships with what is now called a Hogging truss this consisted of a stout rope which was passed over the tops of a series of vertical struts, its two ends being looped under and round the ends of the ship. So as to prevent them from drooping, figure 10, this rope could be tightened by some form of Spanish windlass. The latter device is a skein of cords which can be twisted, and so shortened, by means of a long stick or lever thrust through its middle. Thus the big reed hull could be strained to any degree of straightness or vertical curvature which the skipper happened to fancy. As the art of shipbuilding progressed, the Egyptians came to construct their hulls from timber, rather than from bundles of reeds. But, since. Figure 10. Egyptian sea-going vessel, C2500 BC this one is built of wood but retains the vertical ornaments at stem and stern characteristic of rebuilt boats. The wooden planks are very short and badly fastened, hence this ship also retains the traditional Egyptian hogging truss. Note the A-shaped mast. Greek shipwrights were more advanced than the Egyptian ones and they built the splendid triremes or fighting galleys upon which the sea power of Athens depended. However, these ships were also built from short lengths of timber, and their light hulls were very flexible and much inclined to leak. For these reasons the Greeks retained the hogging truss in the sophisticated form which was called the hyokozoma. This was a substantial rope which ran right round outside the hull, high up and just beneath the gunwale. Again the hyokozoma was set up by means of a Spanish windlass which could be adjusted as needed by the helmsman. Since Greek warships fought mainly by ramming each other, they had to be able to withstand a great deal of structural abuse. The Hyokozoma was therefore an essential part of the hulls of these ships, they were unable to fight, or even to go to sea at all, without it. Just as it used to be the practice to disarm modern warships by removing the breech blocks from the guns, so, 
In classical times, disarmament commissioners used to disarm triremes by removing the hyokozamana. It is quite clear that the Athenian shipbuilders, down in the Piraeus, were familiar with the principles of trussing, and one might well ask why the Athenian architects, such as Nesicles and Ictinus, did not latch on to the idea for the roofs of their temples. Perhaps the analogy between hogging and sagging never struck them, or perhaps they just never hobnobbed with shipwrights. After all, how many house architects today ever talk to a naval architect? When the fragile word fighting galley went out of use, hogging trusses disappeared. However, the American river steamboats of the 19th century were every bit as flexible as the Greek trireme or the Egyptian vessels on the Nile. Their shallow wooden hulls presented exactly the same problems, and the Americans solved these problems in precisely the same way as the ancient. The shape of the hull by screwing or unscrewing the hogging truss. The fact that the hulls of these steamers leaked, in consequence, even worse than the hulls of the triremes did not matter very much because they were provided with steam bilge pumps. Trusses also occur, of course, in many different forms in connection with the rigs of almost every kind of sailing ship. Very probably, the sail is another Egyptian invention, for on the Nile the wind blows upstream for most of the year, so that cargo vessels can sail up the river with a fair wind and drift back downstream with the current, as they still do today. The first problem in constructing a sailing ship is to erect some kind of mast upon which sail can be hoisted. The second, and much more difficult, problem is to keep that mast in place. Broadly speaking, the masts of conventional sailing ships are, structurally, simple poles or struts which are supported from a sufficient number of directions by the system of fixed ropes which seamen call standing rigging, that is to say, by shrouds and stays. If one has a hull which is rigid enough to withstand the pull of the shrouds and stays, this is nearly always the best arrangement, and, as we shall see in Chapter 14, it can be shown mathematically to minimize the weight and cost. However, the Egyptians had not done this sort of mathematics, and, furthermore, they had no preconceived ideas about the subject. All they knew was that they were rather tired of rowing and they wanted to find some way of supporting a newfangled thing called a sail above a hull which was made from reeds. Having spent a good deal of time in developing sailing rigs for the pneumatic rescue dinghies which were carried by bomber aircraft asterisk I can sympathize with the ancient Egyptians about this business of masts. The blown up hulls of the pneumatic dinghies were probably just about as flexible as the Egyptian reed boats. One cannot really expect to be able to attach highly loaded ropes to a thing like a soggy balloon or to a floppy bundle of reeds, and in these circumstances the whole idea of Standing rigging becomes rather laughable. Very sensibly, therefore, the Egyptians merely planted a sort of tripod, or sometimes an A-shaped truss, on top of the rather squidgy hull, figure 10. This affair worked perfectly well on the Nile, I used to envy the ancient Egyptians their solution to the problem, which, unfortunately, was never practicable with the rescue dinghies. The Egyptians did not have to arrange for the whole of their sailing rig to be folded up and packed inside a small bag, which, in turn, had to be stowed in a crowded aircraft. The hulls of Greek and Roman merchant ships were generally sufficiently strong and stiff to resist the loads imposed on them by conventional standing rigging. And so these vessels had their masts stepped in the middle of the ship and supported by shrouds and stays in the usual way. For some reason, however, even large Roman ships seldom got much beyond the stage of a single mast, carrying one large square sail, set from one long yard. It was not until the great expansion of sea voyaging at the time of the Renaissance that the rig of large sailing ships was elaborated by multiplying the number of masts and sails. About this time the single mast was replaced by three, called the four, main, and mizzen masts. Eventually, each of these masts was extended upwards so as to be able to carry, above the lower square sails or courses first, square topsails, then to gallants, and finally royals. The even loftier skysails and moonsails came much later, 
an affectation of the clipper era. Traditionally each sail, course, topsail, to gallant, and royal is set from its own separate section of mast. That is to say, each lower mast is surmounted by a topmast, each topmast in turn by a such unwieldy objects in a rolling ship. However, a big warship would have a crew of 800 men, most of whom could have put both steeplejacks and trained athletes to shame. The sail drill in the Mediterranean fleet in the 1840s has become legendary. It is alleged that, when the admiral had finished his breakfast, he was apt to signal all ships will strike topmasts. Report time taken and number of casualties however this may be, it is certain that crack battleships like HMS Marlborough could be stripped to their lower masts by their own crews in a matter of minutes and re-rigged as quickly. These competitive exercises were by no means a waste of effort. Ships carried ample supplies of spare spars, and the safety of a ship in an emergency, or the outcome of an action in time of war, had repeatedly depended upon how quickly crippled masts could be replaced. A limited number of casualties during peacetime drills had to be accepted, as we accept accidents in riding or rock climbing. The structural technology behind all this was superb of its kind, and it is worthy of the attention of modern engineers, who are apt to be rather snooty about it. The complexity of the rigging which was needed to support all the tofamper in the later sailing ships can best be appreciated by going to look at the Victory, Play 14, or the Cuddy Sark. The total height of Victory's main mast, for instance, is about 223 feet, 67 meters. The length of her main yard is 102 feet, 30 meters, but this can be extended at will to a total width of 197 feet, 59 meters, by means of sliding stunsail booms. All this immense mechanism worked, and worked reliably, for years on end and in spite of the most appalling conditions of wind and sea being much more reliable than most modern machinery. The masts of big sailing ships represent perhaps the most elaborate and certainly one of the most beautiful systems of trussing which has ever been developed. At the cost of considerable complexity, the total weight of structure up aloft was kept down to a safe figure. However, when big guns, mounted in revolving turrets, had to be introduced into sailing battleships around 1870, the network of shrouds and other ropes was found to restrict unduly the arcs of fire of the guns. For this reason certain ironclads, notably HMS Captain, were fitted with tripod masts which could be arranged so as to permit a better field of fire. This was a reversion to the Egyptian method of masting, if you like. However, the extra top weight, if these tripod structures had a bad effect upon the already precarious stability of these ships. This top weight undoubtedly contributed to the capsizing of the captain, under sail, one dirty night in the Bay of Biscay. Nearly 500 men were drowned. It is evident that, functionally, it does not make much difference whether a beam is in the form of a long continuous piece of material, a solid tree trunk or a steel rod or tube or joist, or whether it takes the shape of some kind of open work truss. This latter might be a wooden roof truss, a seagoing arrangement of ropes and spars, or some modern Meccano-like lattice, such as a bridge or an electricity pylon. As we shall see, there are plenty of both kinds of beams in animals as well. The fact that bridges and root trusses and horses' backs and docks are usually more or less horizontal, while ships' masts and telegraph poles and pylons and ostriches' necks are quite often vertical, does not make much difference. The essential purpose of all these structures is the same, that is to say, a load which acts at right angles to the length of the beam is supported without putting any longitudinal force upon whatever is supporting the beam. This is essentially what all beams are for. It might be thought that a thing like a ship's mast was an exception to this, because a mast thrusts downwards, forcibly, upon the hull of a ship. But then the shrouds and stays pull upwards on the hull just as much, and so there is no net vertical force upon the hull, which does not rise or sink in the water in consequence. Similar arguments apply with many animal structures.
A horse's neck, for instance, is very much like a mast. The vertebrae, like the mast, are in compression and push backwards on the horse's body, but they are stayed, like the mast, by the neck tendons, which pull forwards on the body with an equal and opposite force. In the sense which we have just been discussing, all beams, living or dead, do the same job, yet beams as a whole tend to fall into two main categories, cantilevers and simply supported asterisk beams. There are in fact further variants and subdivisions, which are frequently useful for examination and other purposes, but we shall ignore them for the moment. Figure 11. A cantilever beam with distributed load. A cantilever is a beam one end of which can be considered as being built into some rigid support, such as a wall or the ground. This end condition is called by engineers and caster, which is. Figure 12. Simply supported beam. A simply supported beam, figure 12, is one which rests freely on supports at both ends. Structurally, the two cases are closely connected. From figure 13 we can see that a simply supported beam is simply equivalent to two cantilevers, back to back and turned upside down. Figure 13. A simply supported beam may be considered as two cantilevers back to back and upside down. The road is carried across valleys hundreds of feet in depth on root trestle bridges, which creak and groan beneath the weight of the train. Anything apparently more insecure than these structures can hardly be found elsewhere, and I always drew a long breath of relief as I found myself safely on the other side. It is a fearful thing to look out of the carriage windows into the dizzy depth below, and feel that if the frail fabric were to collapse, as it seemed on the point of doing, we should all be dashed to pieces with no possibility of escape. Even in the eastern states many of these primitive bridges yet remain, and it is said that few accidents have happened from their use. They are, however, very liable to destruction from fire, caused by burning coals falling from the engine. Rev. Samuel Manning, LLD, American Pictures, 1875. The English railways were built straight and level across the rolling English landscape by the lavish use of cuttings and embankments and splendid viaducts of masonry and iron work. All this engineering luxury depended upon supplies of capital and labor, both of which were plentiful in Victorian England. Conditions in America were totally different asterisk the distances were enormous. Capital was scarce, the wages, even of unskilled men, were high. In the land of the free, where every man was an amateur, skilled craftsmen of the European type scarcely existed. Iron was expensive, but there was unlimited cheap timber. Above all, the American railroad engineers, like their steamboat colleagues, were prepared to take risks with other people's lives and property which made the hair of British engineers rise up under their stovepipe hats. Yet these British engineers were certainly not unduly cautious men, nowadays we should consider them rash. Nineteenth-century Americans, of course, were in the habit of living dangerously, but this was more on account of their engineers than of the Red Indians or the bandits. The railroads were pushed westwards as fast as they could be built and with a minimum of expensive cuttings and embankments. When conditions were suitable, the valleys were bridged by means of those enormous timber trestle viaducts which alarmed the Rev. Dr. Manning. They will always be associated, in tradition, with the American railways, a fair number of them survive today. Play 15. Once they had been constructed, the American railways were vastly profitable, the Central Pacific Railroad is said to have paid dividends of 60 per center and so they were soon able to convert many of their precarious trestle bridges to solid earth embankments by tipping soil from the top from specially constructed trains until the whole wooden structure was encased in earth and could be left to rot away. White and rolling rivers could not be crossed by the trestle viaducts and so there was a need for large, long span bridges. Permanent bridges of the European type were often impracticable for lack of money and skilled labor, and so there was a very active requirement for long and cheap 
Dot wooden trusses, which could be made by ordinary joiners. Since the construction of these trusses was potentially profitable and since the Americans are an incurably inventive people. A very considerable number of 19th century Americans seem to have spent their time in inventing trusses. There are therefore to be found in the textbooks a very considerable number of designs for America, perhaps more on account of Bauman's political talents than his technical ones. He somehow managed to persuade the American government that his was the only safe design of truss, and at one time its use was made compulsory. This may not have been quite so difficult a legislative feat as one might suppose, since it came to be accepted for many years as a practical working principle by professional engineers. That the technical ignorance of the American congressman could safely be regarded as bottomless asterisk. Figure 14. Bauman truss. Figure 14 shows a simplified Bauman truss with only three panels. In practice there were usually a great many more, and the whole thing tended to get complicated. Besides this the tension members were unnecessarily long. The pink truss, figure 15, does the same job as the Bauman truss, but does it rather better, using shorter members. Figure 15. Pink truss. We can, with benefit, put a continuous member along the bottom of the fink truss and turn it into what is more or less a Pratt or Howe truss, figure 16. This is pretty well what is generally used in the traditional biplane. It will be seen that the Pratt or the Howe truss will work equally well upside down, that is to say, either in hocking or in sagging. Provided that we take certain common sense precautions. Furthermore, if we arrange that all the figure 16 Pratt or how truss so far we have considered all these bridges as being simply supported beams and so of course a great many of them were and are however a number of beam bridges are cantilever bridges for some reason cantilever bridges were never very popular in wooden construction but they are widely used nowadays when built from steel and concrete a good proportion of the bridges over the motorways are reinforced concrete cantilever bridges. Such bridges generally have a center section which is a simply supported beam, resting on the extremities of two cantilevers, figure 18. This is partly because it is easier to accommodate the deflections with this arrangement. However, there are a few bridges where the two cantilevers just stick out from each side and meet in the middle. Figure 17. War and girder. In the days when very long railway bridges were being built it became fashionable to construct large steel cantilever bridges. The most famous example is the fourth railway bridge, which was completed in 1890. It was the first important bridge to be built from open hearth steel asterisk and, in fact, contains 51,000 tons of it. However, road bridges generally do not need so much rigidity as railway bridges, the fourth bridge is said to be the only large bridge in the world over which trains are allowed to pass at full speed. And so most long modern bridges are suspension bridges, which are usually cheaper to build. The fourth road bridge, which has a similar total span to the railway bridge next door to it, and which was finished in 1965, contains only 22,000 tons of steel. From all this it is clear that beams and trusses of various sorts and kinds play an immensely important part in sustaining the burdens of the world. What is rather less clear is just how they do it. How do the stresses work in a beam and what is it that really keeps the thing up? As we have said, lattice trusses and solid beams can nearly always be used interchangeably, and so, as one might suppose, the stress system within a truss is not very different in principle from that in a solid beam. Although it has the advantage of being rather easier to visualize. Furthermore, cantilevers are perhaps easier to think about than simply supported beams, although as we have seen from figure 13, the two conditions are quite simply related. Let us consider therefore a truss in the form of a cantilever which is fixed to a wall, or an caster at one end and which sticks out and supports a load W, for instance, from the other end. Let us begin, in fact, 
with the embryonic or nascent candle ever which is the simple triangular arrangement shown in figure 19. In this affair the weight, W, is directly kept from falling down by the action of the upward component of the tension in the slanting member 1. The compressive force in the horizontal member 2 can only act horizontally, and so it can play no direct part in sustaining the weight. However, they also serve who only push horizontally, and member number 2 is performing an indirect but very necessary function in keeping the truss extended, that is to say, sticking out in the way it does. Figure 19. Figure 20. Let us now add an extra panel to the truss, as in figure 20. It is clear that the weight is now sustained directly by the combined upward action of the tension in number 1 and the compression in number 3. Number 4 is necessarily in tension but, like number 2, which is still in compression, it does not contribute directly to sustaining the weight, although the truss cannot hold up without it. If we build the truss up into several panels, as in figure 21, the general situation remains very much the same. The diagonal members 1 and 5 are in tension and 3 and 7 are in compression. It is still these members which directly sustain the load. Taken together, these members are resisting what is called shear. We shall have a good deal more to say about shear in the next chapter. In the meantime, we may observe that the force which is acting in all of these diagonal members is numerically similar. This remains true however long the candle ever may be and however many panels it has. This is not true, however, of the horizontal forces. The compression in 2 is greater than in 6 and, in the same way, the tension in 4 is greater than the tension in A. The longer we make the candle ever, the higher the compression will be in member number 2 and the greater the tension in number 4. If we make the candle ever very long, then the horizontal or longitudinal tension and compression forces and stresses close to the fixed end may be very high indeed. In other words, such a candle ever will probably break near its root, which after all is only common sense. However, we do have the apparent paradox that the forces are highest in members which do not contribute directly to supporting the load. This diagonal trellis by introducing more slanting members, which will all perform the same function. In fact, this is often done for various reasons, figure 22. This is just what nature quite frequently does. The trunk and rib cage of most vertebrates can be considered as a sort of simply supported beam. This is obvious in the case of a horse. The bones of the vertebrae and the ribs form the compression members of a rather elaborate fink truss, figures 15 and 23. The space between the ribs is crisscrossed by a web or network or trellis of muscular tissue which runs roughly at plus or minus 45 degree to the ribs. Figure 22. The shear can equally well be taken by a multiple lattice or indeed by a continuous plate. The next step in an engineering structure is to fill in the space in the middle of a truss, not with some kind of lattice, but with a continuous plate or web of some material like steel or plywood. This sort of beam can take many forms but probably the most familiar is the ordinary H or I beam, figure 24. The function of the plate or web in the middle of the beam is just the same as that of the zigzag trellis in a truss, and so the loads and stresses in the web run in much the same way. Figure 23. Many vertebrate animals form a sort of faint truss with muscles and tendons making a rather complicated diagonal shear bracing between the ribs. Figure 24. In many engineering beams the shear is taken by a continuous plate web but the tension and compression stresses due to shearing are still at plus or minus 45 degree. 5. As we have said, the longitudinal tension and compression stresses which act along the length of a beam are frequently higher and more dangerous than the shearing stresses. Even though these longitudinal stresses do not themselves contribute directly towards supporting the load. In the ordinary beams which we are likely to meet in practice, it is very commonly the longitudinal stresses which are liable to cause failure, and so they are frequently the first stresses to be calculated by an engineer. Although beams of each section, figure 24, are common, a beam may be of any cross-sectional shape, 
and ordinary beam theory calculations apply to beams of most simple shapes. In fact, the distribution of longitudinal stresses across the thickness of a beam is essentially similar to the distribution of stresses across the thickness of a masonry wall, Chapter 9. With the important difference that, whereas the masonry cannot take tensile stresses, the beam can. Every beam must deflect under the load which is applied to it and it will therefore be distorted into a curved or bent shape. Material on the concave or compression face of a bent beam will be shortened or strained in compression. Material on the convex or tension face will be lengthened or strained in tension, figure 25. If the material of the beam obeys Hooke's law, the distribution of stress and strain across any section of the beam will be a straight line. And there will be some point zero at which the longitudinal stress and strain is neither tensile nor compressive, but is zero. This point lies on what is called the neutral axis, Na, of the beam. Figure 25. Distribution of stress through the thickness of a beam. Since it is important to know the position of the neutral axis in a beam, it is fortunate that this is easy to determine. It is quite simple to show, algebraically, that the neutral axis must always pass through the centroid or center of gravity of the cross section of the beam. For simple symmetrical. From the neutral axis. This distance is generally called Y when discussing beam theory. Asterisk now if we are seeking structural efficiency whether in terms of weight of material, or cost, or metabolic energy, then we do not want to keep any cats that don't catch mice. In other words we do not want to have to provide material which carries little or no stress. This means that we want, as far as possible, to discard material which lies close to the neutral axis in favor of material as far away from it as possible. Of course, we shall need to leave some material near the neutral axis so as to carry the shearing stresses, but in practice we may not need much material for this purpose and quite a thin web may suffice. Figure 26. Figure 26. Tension or compression stress due to bending at a point distant y from the neutral axis is S where and M equals bending moment I equals second moment of area of cross section. For how to arrive at M and I, see Appendix 2. This is why, in engineering, steel beams usually have a cross section of H or channel or Z form. Figure 24. These sections have the advantage of being relatively easy to make from mild steel in a rolling mill. They are often known as rolled steel joists, R. S.J.S, and nowadays they can be bought in very large sizes. Z sections have the advantage over channels and HS that it is easier to rivet the flanges to a plate. This is why ZS are often used for ship's ribs. When simple sections of this sort are unsuitable it is quite common to use built-up box sections. The first and most important use of these was in Stevenson's Britannia Bridge over the Minas Straits. 1850, plate 16 and chapter 13, figure 11, p291. Since the introduction of waterproof glues and reliable plywood, box beams are often used in wooden construction, particularly in the wing spars of both ships and aircraft, notably with the old Junkers monoplanes. However, the objections are obvious, and it is much more usual nowadays to stiffen and strengthen metal skins in shipbuilding and in aerospace by riveting or welding metal angles, called stringers, to the inside surfaces of the skin. In all these situations the load commonly comes upon the beam from one direction only, and the shape of the cross-section is optimized with regard to this condition. In some engineering structures and in very many biological ones, however, the load may come from any direction. This is roughly true for lamp posts, chair legs, bamboos and leg bones. For such purposes it is better to use a round, hollow tube, and of course this is what is very often done. An intermediate case occurs with Bermuda masts. These are generally made from tubes of oval or pear-shaped section. This is not primarily so as to reduce wind drag by streamlining as is often supposed, but rather to cater for the fact that it is much easier to stay a modem mast laterally than it is in the fore and aft plate. 
And so the mass section has to take account of this by providing more strength and stiffness for and aft. Asterisk, of course, a great many small Norman churches have simple wooden roofs, but the design of these roofs is often such that they thrust outwards upon the walls nearly as badly as a stone vault. In Pompeii, where the windows are inadequate and the artificial light must have been bad, the walls of nearly all the rooms are painted either dark red or black. One wonders why. Asterisk I am not a pillar, but a buttress, of the established church, since I support it from without, Lord Melbourne. Asterisk 1 Kings 5, where there is a strong hint that Solomon had to pay a stiff price. Asterisk the Nine Tailors, Gaulinch, 1934. But the root trusses of the little church of saints within at Wickham in Berkshire are decorated with large Victorian papier-mâché elephants. Asterisk for the benefit of any unfortunate airman who may have had involuntary experience of these devices, I would explain that I would go about the job quite differently nowadays. Asterisk the cost per mile of American railways was one-fifth of that of English lines, although American wages were much higher. Asterisk as late as 1912, during the American governmental inquiry into the loss of the liner Titanic, the following exchange was recorded. Senator X, you have told us that the ship was fitted with watertight compartments. Expert witness, yes. Senator X, then will you explain how it was that the passengers were not able to get inside the watertight compartments when the ship sank? Asterisk the New Science of Strong Materials, Chapter 10. Asterisk see Appendix 2. Asterisk notice also the corrugations in clamshells and in many kinds of leaves, such as hornbeam, or polaris and the bias cut nighting. Twist yet, yeah, twine yet, yeah. even so mingle shades of joy and woe, hope and fear, and peace, and strife, in the thread of human life. Sir Walter Scott, Guy Mannering. There is supposed to have been a book review by Dorothy Parker which started off, this book tells me more than I care to know about the principles of accountancy. And indeed I dare say that many of us are apt to come to the conclusion that the way in which things behave in sheer might, after all, be left to the experts. Tension and compression we feel we can cope with, but when it comes to sheer we think we can detect a tendency for the mind to bottle. It is unfortunate, therefore, that the sheer stresses to which we are introduced in the elasticity textbooks are assumed to spend their time inhabiting things like crankshafts or the more boring sorts of beams. Though undeniably worthy, this approach somehow lacks human appeal.